grace and peace. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Change Fellowship Live. I am your host for the day, Chris Bailey. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time is when, by the Lord's grace, we're going to come together every Sabbath morning to worship together, to study together, to pray together, to learn together, because very soon, through Jesus Christ, we're going to be going home together. And so that's what we want to celebrate. We want to thank you for making us a part of your day, a part of your worship. If you're here for the very first time, we want you to feel comfortable. If you've been here from the very beginning, we want you to feel comfortable because we believe that the Lord has presented a prophetic opportunity for us to worship together. Most of you know that where you are, probably your place of worship is closed. Some of you may not have a worship home yet. And I believe the Lord is trying to do something to allow us to be together in a way that would not have happened were the circumstances we're in now not to be. So I'm so glad that Romans tells us all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. And what we want to do here before we start anything is we just want to give a prayer of praise, a prayer of thanksgiving. And there are a couple of ways that you could participate in that. If you're watching through YouTube, you can actually um, submit a comment in the comment box. Tara is on both of those. Tara Bailey, my wife, the other part, the other half of Change Ministry, she's holding that down. If you're uh, going to send a message to us through the chat, or if you're going to send a message through email, if you're watching online at our website, changeministry.org, that is where you can also, if you go down, scroll just below the video, you're going to see a comment section. In that comment section, I'll show you here in a bit, uh, you can actually submit a comment that allows us to stay in touch with each other as well. So those are a couple of things we wanted to make sure that you knew so that in the event that you want to say something, if you want to ask something, if you just want to share something, that's how you can do that so that we can have some communication. We can have some discourse and keep in touch with one another. So with that said, I'm going to mute our music here and we're going to go ahead and transition now into our prayer time. So as we pray, let's bow our heads and let's thank the Lord for our time together. Father, I thank you so much in the name of Jesus for blessing us to be able to be together. We know that this is all in you. We know that every time we have an opportunity to show our, our love for you, our commitment to you, that you show up. And that means a lot to you when so many and most people don't care, don't even know how much you love them. And so, Father, we are asking in the name of Jesus that you would bless our time. Nobody should leave here discouraged. Nobody should leave here with, with more questions than answers. All of us, whenever we see you, whenever we hear you, should get something more. And because of the encounter, leave here changed. I need a change, Lord. Our family, we need a change. This country, this world needs a change and only you can give it to us. So for everyone who's under the sound of our voice, Lord, we pray right now that you would give them that change. Like the woman at the well, feed them and, and, and satisfy their thirst in a way that only you know so that when it's done, everyone will know it was you and it will draw others to do the same. That's our prayer. And I'm grateful that you're here because you always hear everything we ask for. But I know that this is going to happen because we're asking it because it's your will. And we're asking it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. And if you want to pray that with us, co-sign with us. Let's all say wherever we are. Amen. Amen. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord, because once you invite him in, that is the presence of the Lord. That place is, is special. So wherever you are, your room, your living room, your bedroom, your kitchen, at church, anywhere. That's a special place because God is there. And that's why you're special to him, too. And so it's good to know that now we're in our special place. Let's go ahead and get into our special word. What we like to do is when we come together, we do want to have a little bit of a flow, a little bit of a um, little bit of a way or order that we walk. So that way we kind of know where we're going and what we're doing. So what I want to show you here uh, is a couple of tips. First off, just some tech tips for those of you who may be watching and you have some difficulty and you run into a snag. Give me a moment here. I'm going to switch something. If you see me, by the way, looking down, when I'm looking down, um, I'm not playing a video game or anything. I'm trying to manage and move the screen that you're actually, by God's grace, being able to see where you are. And so by you being able to see it, it allows you um, to be able to participate with us. So if you see me doing something, that's what I'm doing. 
um, or trying to answer a reply to someone's comment or something of that nature. All right. So just so you would not feel again, you're not special. Everyone's special here. When we come together and worship. But if you have a problem, technologically speaking, um, and we're going to deal with the spiritual ones too. <laughs> if you hit a, a, um, a technical difficulty, uh, make sure you hit the refresh or reconnect button on the top of your browser, um, whether it's on your phone or whether you're watching on your PC or your Mac, that's a little circle button that allows you to refresh, kind of resets everything. So if I freeze, that's the first thing that you want to do. Next thing is just try a totally different browser. You may be in Chrome. You may want to jump over into uh, edge. And if you're in edge, you may want to go back to Chrome or even Firefox our browser of choice. Um, so those are things that you can do if your browser is freezing up on you. Another thing is make sure you turn off all of your ad blockers and virus software because you may be getting this in a pop-up, your phone or, or whatever you're watching on may block it out just because it doesn't recognize the URL or the website. That's another thing you can do to make sure that your um, add-ons and uh, ad blockers and software virus is turned off. And lastly, just turn everything else off. Turn all your other applications off. Let your phone, let your computer have a Sabbath, right? Where it's only focusing on one thing and it's focusing on what we're doing together here right now. So just in case you hit a road bump, that's a way to get through it in the event that we have problems with our um, transmission. So we want to welcome everybody, welcome you to being here because now we're going to spend some time in study. And what we study normally here, we call it Sabbath School Study Group or Triple SG. And Sabbath School Study Group is just a study of what's known as the Sabbath School Lesson. Those of you who worship on Sabbath are familiar with that concept. Those of you who may go to Sunday worship, that's normally called a Sunday School Lesson. Well, we have a Sabbath School Lesson. In our Sabbath School Lesson, we study systematically a particular topic for about 12 or 13 weeks. And then we go into a whole nother broad topic and we break that down and we really look at it from every angle through the word and through biblical commentary to get an understanding so that everybody around the world, everyone who's reading this lesson, we're all studying the same thing. We're growing together. So that's why we're studying Sabbath school here as we participate in Sabbath school worship. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump over and we're going to bring myself back. And we're going to bring myself down and we're going to jump over now into the lesson. And the way that you can get to the lesson is if you join me and if you're watching online, again, you can do that. Oh, not time for change health yet. We're in Sabbath school. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drop out of this and we're going to go into the lesson. And if you want to follow along online, I'm going to show you how you can do that. Whoops. What you want to do is open up your browser again. I'm going to try and open up the browser here again. All right. And here we go. And we're going to go to ssnet.org. So I know you got your homepage I already said at changeministry.org. So if you're starting where we are, <laughs> all right, we're going to go here and we're going to type in ssnet.org. And even if you don't go on your computer, it's okay. You're going to be able to follow along with me. I'm just showing you how you can get to the lesson uh, together with me. And so it looks like it's already jumped into, there we go. Here we are in today's lesson, which happens to be lesson number 13. This is the last lesson studying the book of Daniel. And we're going in chapter 12, talking about going from dust to stars. And so before we go into that part, I also want to remind you that you also can use a Bible app. A cool one that we use is blueletterbible.org. It allows you to put in the verse. For example, if you put in the verse here and you bring it up, it goes directly to that verse. And that's another way that we can follow together. Whoops, it should have gone directly to it. I must not have put in verse. There we go. And there is the verse I just sent in to read. So this is going to be one of the Bible references that we use. I also have a cool Bible app here uh, on our PC, King James Bible app. It's free in the Microsoft store and allows you to go to the Bible this way as well. So we're going to be going between these two. This is the one that I use uh, for our study, but you can also go through and use this one on your browser as well. So now that we're all having the same footing, let's have the same fun and get into a powerful chapter because Daniel 12 is a powerful chapter simply because um, it is allowing us to see into the future. That was the whole purpose and the whole intent, the mind of God behind the book of Daniel chapter 12. 
So when you get down and you look at our central verse for this week's lesson, look at what it says there. And we can even read it together. I want to invite you. Let's read together there. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number three. What does it say here? It says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This wisdom is not innate. In other words, this angel that's speaking to Daniel, Gabriel in his, in his revelation to Daniel is not saying, you just gotta be smart to know what God's doing, or you just gotta have an inside track, or it depends on who you know who you know. No, 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 no. Verse three says, they have been made wise because it says that they're shining, their brightness, that's a transferred brightness. That's a brightness that comes from being in the presence of the morning star. See, when you understand that, you know, we were talking about, um, Man, I forgot we were talking about. So I'll use this reference. You know, when you've been somewhere, you can always tell when someone's um, or what they've eaten sometimes. Sometimes you can tell um, by how they smell. Like there's a smell that you get when you go and you eat in uh, uh, an Asian buffet or a carry out joint. Or even even I remember from a child, you know, we had 7-Eleven back where we lived. And I remember I could I smelled differently when I came out of the, the gas station, maybe because of the gas and cigarette smoke or whatever, I, I could tell when someone had been into a 7-Eleven, there, there was something on them. It works the same way. When you've been in the presence of God, when the Lord is in your life and involved actively, not passively, because he's over everything. God is sovereign. Even if you've turned your back on the Lord for 50 years, he's still in your life. How do I know? Because there's still breath in your lungs. That's passive involvement. You haven't allowed him to really get in there actively. And when he's actively involved, when you bow your head and say, Lord, come into my heart. Jesus, save me. Lord, make a way. When you do those things, there's a scent that comes from him to you. And this is the wisdom. This is this wisdom that comes on the people of God because they're in the presence of God. That's why it's important that we spend time in study, more time in study than we do watching the news. We're going to talk about that during our health show and tell in the next segment. It's important that we spend time thinking about God, not even the Bible doesn't even have to be open. But from what I've read and from what I've studied, I'm just taking time to reflect and to just think on it and settle. It changes us. It deepens the impression. And ultimately, it seals us in his righteousness so that even though the heavens are shaken, we can't be moved. These are those who are wise. And this is why God's given us Daniel, particularly chapter 12. So let's look at it. Daniel chapter 12, it starts there in Daniel 12. I invite you to turn there and we're going to look at verse number one. We're going to probably hit this thing verse by verse because, oh, I just realized I needed um, I needed something. And so I, I, I will use something else. So that's what we'll do. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. So let's get to it. Michael, our prince, Daniel chapter 12 in verse number one. Praise the Lord. He's always got another way to do his thing. Let's go there. Daniel 12. And in Daniel 12, you see something very powerful happening because you see a transition. You see a change of position here in verse number 12. You see this change of position, particularly on the part of the one called Michael. And we've already determined that this Michael is, in fact, Jesus Christ, the king of kings, the prince of princes, the Lord of lords. This is his comic book name. As we said in our previous study, all right, in our previous study um, that Jesus is using to describe himself here in the book of Daniel. So this is Jesus. And it says now that at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. Everything that Jesus does, he is doing for you. He's sitting beside the Lord for us. Why? Because Hebrews says he is our high priest. He's your intercessor. That's why we pray in the name, in the spirit of Jesus Christ, that through his righteousness, what we're asking for will be done and what we want to be made known will be heard. But now in Daniel 12, he's not just sitting for us, but now he stands up for us. You might be in a situation like we are, where you need Jesus to stand up for you, where you don't know and you know that what you don't know is not good. What am I talking about? You know that there are people doing things or saying things about you that you know are not true. 
And in that situation, it's impossible for you to isolate the threat because you can't go to every person that person's talked to and everything that that person has done without driving yourself crazy. So ultimately, as a believer, whether it's down in Daniel 12, 1, or whether it's right now where you are dealing with, you know, Jesus, you will stand up for me. And here in verse one, he stands for the children of thy people. He's speaking to Daniel and these are the children of his people. So now he says, I'm going to stand for you. But what happens when Jesus stands? When Jesus stands, I need that door closed. Thank you. When Jesus stands, look at what it says. It says, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, let's just let's break this up as it did in Sunday, Monday's lesson. Let's break this up into two parts, because this first part of the lesson is basically trying to isolate the reality that, yes, this is Jesus Christ. When you go there, it says, as we glimpse in our study, look here in verse 10, when we study back in Daniel 10, Michael's the same powerful heavenly being who appears to Daniel at the Tigris River. There he emerges as the heavenly representative of God's people. He also appears elsewhere in Daniel as the son of man in Daniel 7, the prince of the host in Daniel chapter 8, and the Messiah the prince in Daniel chapter 9. So this name Michael, which actually means who is like God, must be none other than Jesus himself. This is vital because unfortunately, we have an entire denomination the Jehovah's Witnesses that look at Jesus as a reality, but Jesus as a created being. They interpret the begetting or the begetting of Jesus as at one time God gave birth or started Jesus. But Michael is a powerful title that totally decimates that false theology because it says he who is like God, he who is equal with God. In fact, Philippians 2 tells us that he was one and he is one with God. Let's read that verse. It's there in Philippians uh, chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, look at what it says here. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Read it verse 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. Equal with God. So when we understand Michael as equal with God, in partnership with God, for the people of God, the actual agent of creation that we read there in Genesis 1 and in Colossians chapter 1, this is why it's important to see that this Michael standing is Jesus standing for you and for me. We spent a whole day studying that, and I hope even in this, this touch that you see here now, when you hear that name, when you see Michael in action, that's like Jesus with his cape on. That's like Jesus in go mode. So now when he's in go mode, what is he going to do? In go mode, we want to go now to Monday's lesson. In Monday's lesson, let's remember now that verse one deals with a lot of issues, but we're going to really get into them. Uh, probably going to get into it to today's lesson because I don't want to skip it before we talk about the resurrection before the resurrection. Let's go back and look back at Daniel chapter one. Look at what the verse said. The verse says, at that time shall Michael stand up. We know who that is. The great prince would stand up for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as was never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now let's deal with this. Because when Jesus is in this position, the world changes. Everything changes because there's going to be a time of trouble. This time of trouble that is spoken of is important because why is there trouble? In other words, by Jesus standing up, moving out of where he is, why does it bring trouble to the world? It brings trouble to the world because what we learned here is that this is the close of probation. The close of probation and judgment now begins on sinners who have not accepted the grace of Jesus Christ. The intent of closing probation is not to condemn sinners. The close of probation is so that Jesus can finally condemn sin. But the problem is, our problem is, is that if we hold on to what Jesus condemns, we then become subject. We become, we get in the way of his work 
of exterminating sin. And this is not even the final judgment. This is the pouring out of the wrath of God on sin. But if sinners do not repent of that sin, they too become condemned. It's so important that we see that because too often we are confusing judgment of God as just condemnation and not as commendation or approbation. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you go to court and when someone goes to court and if that person is found guilty, they have been judged guilty. That's condemnation. They are under the judgment or the penalty now of the law. But when somebody commits a crime or rather or is accused of a crime, accused of a crime and they are found not guilty, friends, that person has been judged innocent. They have been commended to innocent. They are not condemned and the law holds no penalty on them. So when people say, don't judge me, don't judge me. No, no. In Christ, please judge me in Christ. Find me not guilty by virtue of his righteousness in Christ. Find me clear because he cleaned me. We are all going to be judged. It's not about not judging. It's about on what side of judgment do we choose to fall? And Daniel 12 is a reminder to us that, look, eventually our choosing time is going to end because it ends looking there in verse number one to bring a time of trouble such as never was to a nation to that same time. But here is how you know it's a judgment to condemnation, the wrath of God, and also a judgment to commendation, innocency in God. Because the next part of the verse says what? At that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, that's the key. If there's going to be a judgment, yes. But is there a way out? Yes and no. Because I'm not trying to get out of judgment. I'm trying to be judged innocent, judged good. But the Bible tells us, the gospel teaches, no man is righteous, yet one, Jesus Christ. And so those who believe in him are those written in the book. Let's talk about this book. Let's talk about this book now being written in the book. Monday's lesson references it. When we look at what Daniel says here, Daniel 12 says, but those in the book have no reason to fear this time of trouble because they're in the book. See, let's go down here and remember in the understanding of the book, we're reading this paragraph here, make sure you can see it. It says, in order to understand the meaning of this book, we should keep in mind that the Bible mentions two kinds of heavenly books. And we touched on this in that study in Sabbath school study group. What are the two books that are referenced here? We could do an entire study just on these books, but we're just going to touch on them to get an understanding. The Bible mentions a couple of books, and one of them is a book of deeds. This is a book of deeds or what has been done. This is what we see here referenced here in Psalm 56. Let's go to Psalm 56. We'll go through this way. In Psalm 56, look at what it says here. This is a psalm where David is writing and pouring out his heart to God. And when you look at verse number eight, look at what verse number eight says to us. Psalm 56, verse eight. David says here, thou tellest my wonderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? David is obvious here relaying emotion, emotion that's moving him to tears. And he says here, you know everything that's being done. Mark that. Sovereign Lord, he knows everything being done. But he says, remember, even count my tears, record them. Anyway, aren't they already in your book? In other words, everything that I've done, aren't you already recording it in that book? Yes, that's the book of deeds. It's the book of record so that when we are judged, we're not judged based on how God feels or based on the lies that the devil says. We are judged purely on what has been done in our life. And the key for the believing Christian is not then to say, oh, I better do more good than my bad so that I can outweigh my bad to therefore be judged good because that's not enough. The law demands perfection. 
The law demands no error. The law demands complete innocency. And the only way to achieve that is to accept that. I want you to hear that again. I want you to hear the gospel. The only way to achieve that is to accept that. That's the gift of grace, the gift of righteousness in Ephesians chapter two, the gift of God's goodness given to you so that when he looks at what has been done in your life and in my life, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus for every bad thing that I've done. He sees Jesus for every good thing that I've done. He sees Jesus. Therefore, my judgment is rendered secure. Well, 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 how can I how can I get that hook up? Do I have to have a certain attorney? Do I have to have a certain legal team? Yes. His name is Jesus, because now here is where he sees and has the second book. See, the second book is the first book is just what we do. But that book doesn't save us. It just says what we've done. Here is the book. The second book is the book mentioned here in Revelation, excuse me, in the book of Luke. It says Luke chapter 10. Let's go to this one in Luke. I'm going to use the Bible app this time. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, this second book that's mentioned, <clears throat> it says here in Luke 10. Yeah, verse 20. Look at here. Now, this is after they had gotten back from doing miracles. They'd actually seen the Lord do some amazing stuff. In fact, they say the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us in your name. All right. They saw what they were able to do. They had saw some powerful stuff go in their book of deeds, stuff that God had done. But look at what Jesus does. Jesus said to them, look, y'all, I saw Satan fly out of heaven like lightning. So what you've seen can't outsee what I've seen. That's that's great. But let me really explain to you, because I've given to you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That, that's good news. But let me give you great news. Notwithstanding. Now, you know, when I think about what like what God's going to do in the last days with the Lord, the miracles that God's going to do in our lives, he's doing right now. Jesus is saying, here's the greatest miracle of them all. And remember this in light of Daniel 12. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but here is what should just make you go amazingly. Just just praise the Lord. Just wave your hand. Just just shout. Just be like, whoo. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You want to see a miracle? That's a miracle. Some of us have been praying, say, Lord, I, I don't believe you, but I got to see a miracle. I want you to do something special. Man, I'm telling you, he's already done it. Why? Because not only is your name written in the book, the Bible doesn't say that your name, you got to do this so that your name will be written. No, 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 no. When Jesus died on the cross, when he said those last three words, to tell us die, or in our English, it is finished. What he was saying was done was the putting back of everybody's name into the book of life. All of our names have been omitted and erased by what we had done at the Garden of Eden and by virtue of what our grandparents had done there in the Garden of Eden. But now the second Adam had come. Now redemption, Messiah had come. And being born again now, we are the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. We now have a right to the tree of life. And the only way to miss out on it is to not not get it. The only way to lose, the only way to miss out on that is to lose the right. In other words, it's to be blotted out of the book. What I'm trying to get you to understand is, is that you through Jesus Christ have been redeemed. You have been saved. The only way to be lost now is not to not come into the ark, is to leave the ark. It's to leave the ship. I know we need some help with this. I know we might need some help with this because this is a straight gospel. And a lot of us don't understand it. Wait a minute. When I come to Jesus, I'm already home. Remember the prodigal son when he left the house, when he left the house, he left the house. The father didn't kick him out. And when the father in Luke 15 sees his son a great way off, his son's coming back to him. His son is waiting to try and get his sonship back. The father tells he doesn't even tell him to be quiet. He speaks over him and says, hey, everybody, my son who was lost is found. My son who was lost, key word, my son. You're a son and a daughter of God. 
And Daniel 12 is reminding us what we learn here in Luke 10, what we learn here in John 3, 16, when it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, rather, rather it says, but God sent his son in the world, to the, I'm in the wrong verse. Yes, because I'm going to go to verse 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't say he's only available to those who ask. He's given us him. He's given us eternal life. And the only way to miss out on it is to lose it. All that from <laughs> Daniel chapter 12, verse one. This book, uh, where am I trying to go? Where am I trying to go? Oh yeah, I'm trying to go back here. Thank you, Lord. In Daniel chapter 12, the purpose of this book is to remind us is that yes, God's people will be delivered during this terrible time because in the investigative judgment conducted in the heavenly tribunal, the judgment going on up there, they've been vindicated by Jesus because he's our high priest and their names have been written in the book. That's why we're warned to, to be mindful. Did I ever go to Luke? I don't think I ever went to Luke chapter 10. Thank you, Lord. He reminded me, go back to Luke chapter 10 and then look at verse 20. Yes, we did. Because your names are written in heaven. Yes. I want to let that settle for a second. Feel free to send a comment. Feel free to send a question. Um, because I want to make sure we understand this point because we can just get caught up in the prophetic part of it, but not the promise part of it. What it really means to be saved. It is to have our names written in the book. If that is your concern, if that is your focus now, here is your promise. One of the promises is that you will have an opportunity to see God do an amazing thing and do it here on Tuesday's lesson. Let's go there and look at Daniel chapter 12. We're going to look at verses two and three. Daniel chapter 12, verse two and three reference the resurrection. Now, here is where I want to make sure we're all on the same footing. The lesson references a resurrection to take place, the resurrection to take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ and its certainty. And that is gospel truth. In fact, when you look here and you read in 1 Corinthians, uh, the lesson doesn't mention this verse, but in verse number eight, uh, excuse me, verse 18 of Romans eight, when you look here at Romans chapter eight, verse 18, look at what the Bible says. The Bible says to us in a beautiful way, it says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, we have a hope. Our hope is that one day we will see our friends and family, our loved ones, our dearly departed ones who are resting in the grave, awaiting the redemption of Jesus Christ. We have hope because for as much then in Hebrews 2.14, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him. In other words, this is Jesus's death. He'll destroy him that had the power of death. And that's the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. These are hopes and promises that we have to, to give us peace with those whom we've had to say goodbye to. If they've gone to sleep in Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to wake them up again. But Daniel 12, chapter 2 and verses 3 deal with another powerful reality. And I want us to go there now so that we look at it clearly. In Daniel 12, verse two, this is referencing our special resurrection that's going to take place even before that final resurrection of the righteous that we just read about in Hebrews chapter two. Look at what it says here. Remember, where does this happen? At that time shall Michael stand up. Okay, so this is after Michael has stood. Let's look at verse number two. It says there, and many of them, not all, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Now, this is important. It's amazing how the shortest verse can have so much gospel in it. It says, and many. Now, this is important because what we just read, it says many, meaning not everyone's going to be raised up. 
Well, people will say, well, yeah, when Jesus comes, we know a lot of people are not going to be raised up because of what our biblical understanding in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, this is a deep topic and we don't have the time to go all into it. But I want to make sure that you understand that we're in scripture. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. that are the, the key chapters that, where the Lord really spoke to Paul to speak to us about the resurrection. When you read here, it talks about the resurrection. When Jesus comes, it says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Because see, for the Christian, for the believer, that's all death is. It's just a sleep. So that's the word that's used to identify sleep in Bible scripture. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, because at the trumpet's sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on corruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So this is speaking of the resurrection that happens when Jesus comes. And he says here that we are going to be changed. This corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. But not everybody gets up who's been dead at that resurrection. This is only the righteous who've gone to sleep in Jesus. Well, okay, well, what do you mean? Well, again, let's go and look at another verse. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, and I believe it's around chapter 4. <clears throat> and let's look at verse number 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I'm scrolling up. Get my head in the way so you can't see the word. All right, let's kick it up. It says here, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. See, the Lord doesn't want us to be afraid of death. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. So here's a, a situation where inspiration is power. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others which have for have no hope. For we believe that if Jesus rose again and died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Some people interpret that to mean that God's going to bring them from heaven. But that can't make sense because if Jesus is bringing the dead from heaven, if the dead automatically go to heaven when they die, those who die in Christ, what would be the purpose of a resurrection? If they're already awake. So clearly this is speaking to the reality that death is a sleep and that when someone dies, whether they die in Christ or whether they die outside of Christ, their body is resting in the grave, awaiting one of two resurrections. In this case, the resurrection that comes, Jesus, when he comes, God will bring with him. In other words, bring to life with his coming. God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So those righteous who are alive when Jesus comes, we're not going to stop the righteous sleeping from getting up. For the Lord himself in verse 16 shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ. What kind of dead people? The sleep in Jesus will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is speaking of the resurrection of the righteous dead and the righteous living. That leaves two other groups out of the picture. The wicked who are alive, those who have not accepted the grace of Christ and the wicked who have already died before. They don't raise in this resurrection. They await the resurrection to be in Revelation 20 after the thousand years after Jesus Christ has come. Revelation chapter 20. Here we go. Revelation chapter 20. It says, and when, in fact, here's the Bible. We're picking it up here in Revelation chapter 20, verse five. The Spirit's taking us on a quick study of the, of the idea of the death and the dead and the resurrection. All this in one study. The Lord is good. Revelation 20, verse five says, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So we just read how when we're resurrected, the righteous in Christ living and the righteous dead, they are risen up and they're taken to glory. And we're with Jesus for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead here in Revelation 25 did not live again until those thousand years were finished. So the wicked dead, when Jesus comes, they stay dead. And the living wicked, when Jesus comes, they're destroyed. They're destroyed. 
And we're going to remember how and why, because we're going to go back to Revelation. But they're destroyed. Blessed is he and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, this is the one after the thousand years, has no power. But they shall be priests of God in Christ and reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years have been finished, Satan shall be loosed out of prison and he shall go forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. This is when the wicked are resurrected. Satan and his angels have already been enduring that thousand year period with nothing to do here on earth. And now the wicked are raised or they're resurrected and they're now resurrected here to receive final judgment. Verse nine says they went about the breadth of the earth and they come past the camp of the saints about. Remember, the city of God has come down to earth now to the thousand years and fire comes down from God of heaven and devours them. And the devil that cast them into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. Now, that takes us right into another study of hell, because when people read this verse, they read this verse to take it to mean that now, oh, now we're going to burn in hell forever if we don't do what God says. No, that is not just and it is not the way of the Lord, because even when you go back to Daniel chapter 12, go back now to Daniel chapter 12. And when you look at what Daniel 12 says around in verse number two, it says in many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. This is speaking not just of that final resurrection, but this also is speaking of this resurrection before or happening during the time of trouble beginning. I know there's a lot of moving parts. If you got to watch this over again, please do that because it's all being recorded. But we're going scripture by scripture, verse by verse. Because what this is telling us here, on the one hand, let me deal with that whole point of how it talks about shame and everlasting contempt. We're talking about some of those who awake from the dust, some to everlasting life. Obviously, these are those who are raised up. So whether it's at this special resurrection or whether it's at the resurrection of Christ's return, those who are in Christ, they're never going to die again. They have been raised up to everlasting life. But then it says some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, this is talking about the wicked. There are going to be some wicked people in this separate resurrection, this special resurrection that occurs after the close of probation, who are going to be raised up and die when Jesus comes. Who am I talking about? Don't worry. I'm about. To, please trust me. I'm about to get to that verse in a second. Who are these people who get up in this special resurrection you're talking about? I'm not talking about it. Daniel's talking about it. But I'm going to deal with the point of it, the idea of hell being eternal, because look how this verse says some to shame and everlasting contempt. Notice how the verse does not say everlasting shame. It says everlasting contempt. See, when somebody does wrong, that person, when you do wrong, let me say somebody, when we do wrong, when I do wrong, what do we feel? We feel ashamed. We feel ashamed. We feel bad about what we've done. So that's our definition of shame, feeling bad, conscious pricked by the spirit of God that what I've done is wrong. I shouldn't have done that. But then it talks about contempt. What is contempt? Contempt is how somebody feels about the wrong that you did. Contempt is when you think of a person and when you think of that person who did you wrong or who's done wrong and you just kind of shake your head like, mm, man, that that guy, you know, that girl, that's contempt. But what's key about that? We're not just trying to define contempt. Who feels contempt? The person who, do, who does the wrong, who's done wrong, they don't feel contempt. Contempt is the feeling that someone else has for someone who's done wrong. They regret what that person has done. So when Daniel 12, 2 says and to shame, some to shame and everlasting contempt. The contempt is what's everlasting, not the shame. Catch this. Because the contempt is what people feel about what you've done. The righteous will regret the fact that those who've done wrong did wrong. That's everlasting. And only the righteous can feel everlasting contempt because they're the only ones who are living everlasting. But notice how Daniel, the, 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 the angel says, Shame, that's not everlasting. That ends. And it ends once the person has paid the price that Jesus chose, that was going to pay for them, but they've got to pay for it themselves. But they will not pay for it eternally. So they will feel shame. Those who are lost will regret what they've done, but it will not be everlasting because hell does not burn forever. Hell is a period of time appointed to judge perfectly based on what the person did not allow Jesus to forgive. 
So with that kind of arithmetic, who do you think is going to burn the longest? The person who's done the most. And who's done the most? That person Hebrews 2 mentions that Jesus got the victory over, who was the author of death, the instigator of death, the one who opened the door for us to experience death, the devil himself. He's going to burn the longest, him and his demons. And you've got to remember, friend, that hell was not built for you and me. Hell is not designed for you and me. It's designed for demons, devils and fallen angels. There's no place for you unless, unless you choose to blot your name out of God's invitation book. So there's no reason to fear death. There's no reason to fear hell because neither one of them are appointed to the people of God. With that said, let's get back to this special resurrection. Because back here in verse number two, it says, many of them that sleep in the dust shall await, some to everlasting life. Let's talk about them. And some to everlasting, everlasting contempt and shame. So now, who are these? Remember Jesus mentioned when he was on the cross that when he was on the cross, he was there and there were some who were there for him. There were most who were there against him. And while he was having this discourse with the father, he speaks a few words to his mother, to John. And we also have a discourse between him and the thieves on the cross. Powerful thing. These are powerful conversations that Jesus has on the cross. But in the midst of all this, there are people who are there shouting and instigating and, and cursing him. They're going to be dealt with in a special way. And we see this fulfilled in Revelation chapter one. And these people being dealt with in a special way are those who are actually going to be raised up before Jesus returns. Revelation chapter one, verse seven, it talks about the coming of God, right? And look at what it says here. Verse seven says, behold, let me make sure you can see. All right, here we go. Behold. He cometh with clouds. Who is he? This is Jesus. This is Michael. All right. He cometh with clouds. And the Bible says, and every eye shall see him. So when Jesus comes, one of the signs that we know that it's the actual coming of Christ is that you won't have to watch it on TV. You won't catch it on YouTube. It's not going to be on Facebook. You will be able to see him. That's important to note because that's our protection against the false comings and the false messiahs that are going to appear in our lives as we approach the real coming of Jesus Christ. But it also says here, and they which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. So what did Daniel 12 say? Daniel 12 says, some of those who raised up will raise up to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. These are those who are going to be awakened before Jesus comes in that special and that final resurrection of the righteous. These are those, some of those, the Bible says here in Revelation, who are actually there, who pierced him, who cursed him, who set up the trial, who lied against him in trial, who contrived for his persecution, his assassination. They're going to be raised up to see him. They also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. So this is the wicked living who see him coming. And then some of those who were involved with his actual crucifixion are going to get raised up. But the Bible didn't just say them. It said some of them in this special resurrection will be raised up. The Bible says to everlasting life. Who are these people? We don't know. It just says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life. Another cue, another promise that probation has closed that Michael has stood up and now is the time of trouble. And it's the time of trouble because it's the pouring out of the wrath of God. We're going to look at this more during our worship time and during our sermon time later on. But I wanted to touch on this now because this is important as we go forward and hopefully finish this lesson within the hour. So let's go ahead and get now into next day's lesson. And that's going to take us into the sealed book. All right. Now we're trying to roll through this thing. Let's try it. Let's do it. All right. So now the sealed book, we're in verse four of Daniel 12. Remember, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, and I'm pretty sure you probably do, make sure you email them to Tara, uh, chat them up to Tara, and we're going to try and get to them uh, in some point in time that we have here together today. Amen. Let's get to Daniel chapter 12, beginning here at verse number four. All right. Praise God. 
All right. So now let's get to it. Let's get to it. All right. I keep saying let's get to it. Let me go ahead and get to it. This is so much fun. Man. All right. Word. All right. Daniel chapter 12. Talking about the sealed book, right? Daniel chapter 12, verse number four. Look at what it says here. After all that, Gabriel has put Daniel on, just showing him the good news. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Colon. Because what's going to happen after the time of the end? Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Hello. Hello. I'm telling you, God has said them so powerful. He said, Daniel, I love you, but I got some folks down in 2020 who are going to need a word. I got some folks down in 2020 who are going to need this. So I need you to seal it because I don't want you. To, I don't want this to get stale. I want this to stay fresh and I don't want the bottle broken. I don't want the seal cracked until the time of the end. Question we spent all in our previous study. Daniel chapter 11 makes us know what is the time of the end. One of the signs of the time of the end is when it talks about it in Daniel chapter 11, where it tells there, let me just go there because again, I, I never want to, I, I, that's what gets me. That's if, when I take a long time to do stuff, it's because I don't want to leave anybody behind. So forgive me for making sure nobody gets left behind. I don't want you to believe what I say. I want you to believe what you read because that's, what's going to be real to you. And that's what saves us. Even when this is over, we got to get into the worst that we don't, we stop following people. And we start following prophecy and promises revealed in the word of God. That same Bible that you have right in your hands, same Bible I'm reading. And it's the same hope we all can have. So forgive me if I take time and um, I end up taking a long time because I want to make sure everybody understands. Amen. So when it talks about here in Daniel chapter 11, uh, let me see here in Daniel chapter 11 and verse number. Yes. Talking about the time of the end. Is there? Yes. Yes. And verse number 35, Daniel 11. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even until the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed to try them or try by them. The time of the end, as we learn, ended at the conclusion of this trying time that we just read here in Daniel chapter 11. Prophetically, this is known as the 1260 days prophecy, the time that we in history call the dark ages. It was the dark ages because it was not the separation, but the union of church and state. In that union of church and state, whenever it happens, wherever it happens, it always leads to oppression. It always leads to tyranny, fascism, and the release of all things ungodly and the suppression of everything good. And what is good? God said faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please him. But what the dark ages tried to do was to rob him of this special gift and this special opportunity to please the Lord. And it forced people to believe in God rather than giving people freedom to choose him. When that happened, the light of the gospel was snuffed out. It was no longer about what Jesus has done. It's not about what you can do to be saved. And in this dark age, people were persecuted. People were dealt with in a way that will always happen whenever you try to force someone to believe in God. During this time, the Bible said it would last for 1260 years. Prophetically, it began at the fall of the Roman Empire. And finally, at the removal of the Ostrogoths in 538, when their siege of Rome, leaving in their place, the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Rome, based on Justinian's decree in Rome, or rather in 530 AD, he was the Bishop of all bishops. Now he became the church of the church, God on earth, the vicar, the vicar of God. And he began his rule from 538, the dark age of papal oppression, and inquisition and persecution lasted until 1798. Because what happens in 1798? In February, during the French Revolution, General Berthier, the king of uh, the North, spoken of there here in Daniel chapter 11, took the Pope captive, arrested him, and inflicted a wound, a deadly wound, on the beast that we learned in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. So that time of locking up the church, the papal oppression, not the church of God, but the Roman Catholic church, it released now again the winds of the gospel. 
and it ushered in the time of the end. When the, the when the light was brought back, let's go back to Daniel 12, when the light of the gospel was restored, when the light of truth in believing in Jesus Christ alone for salvation was was ignited again. Look at what happens. It says at that time, shut up the words, because even to the time of the end. Because when we get back to believing in Jesus, when we get away from what we can do, the Bible says we will run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. That's what happens personally and it's what's happened prophetically. We are now living in the time of the end. This is not the end of time. The end of time is when? When Jesus comes. But we're in the period now between the time of the end and the end of all time. That's why he said, seal the book. But now open it. It's opened. It's open now to you and me. The book of Daniel is open for business. Everything else may be shutting down. Everything else will be going on furlough, furlough or closing. But Daniel is wide open for us to understand and to know and believe. Because what happens? It says many will run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. The lesson mentions this point. It says from the Protestant Reformation onward, more people began to study the book of Daniel. However, it's only at the time of the end when the book was finally open and its contents more fully revealed. Yes. Now it's open to us. Now it's there for us. Oops, I'm sorry. I got it behind my big head. It's open for us to read. It's open for us to know. So now if that wasn't enough, whoopsie, if that wasn't enough, let's look at these last three time prophecies that are mentioned here in Daniel chapter 11. That's going to take us into the waiting time. So now that we know we're in the time of the end, after 1798, the beginning of, of what we call now this awakening that even leads to the revival of God and the people of God today. Let's look at this. Daniel chapter 12, 5 to 13, a lot of verses. So let's get to it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 5. It says, then I, Daniel, looked and there stood other two. So now remember, he was talking to Gabriel. Gabriel was talking to him. And now in vision, he transitions. This is near the end of the book, y'all, end of the vision. He sees two people. One on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of that bank of the river. So two men are having a conversation standing across on each side of a river. And one said to a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long should it be to the end of these wonders? All these weeks we've been studying, been studying this stuff. How long shall it be? Now, he's not just dealing with all of them, because remember, he just left off here from verse four dealing with the time of the end, he says, these wonders, how long are these wonders going to be? In other words, the wonders are the trying of the people of God during the dark ages. It says here, I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. First time prophecy, time, times, and a half. That's how long what's going to happen when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. This is the first time prophecy introduced here in, Ro in Romans Daniel chapter 12, because here he says that that persecution is going to happen for a times time and dividing of times. How does that look? Well, remember, now we're going to go to. By God's grace. Time, times and a half. I could have had a slide up for you, right? I could have had a slide, right? But I don't. So we're going to do the math right here. Live. Mathematics on Sabbath. <laughs> Probably got some students watching saying, we shouldn't do math on Sabbath. We close the rest. <laughs> no, God invented math. So we can do not math homework, but we can do some gospel math here. Three and a half years, right? That's way too small. Way too small, dude. Let's make this a little bit bigger. All right. Can you see me now? There we go. Three and a half years. Prophetically speaking, one year or three and a half. Let's go back where he said he said a time, times and dividing of times. So a time, one time plus times and dividing of time or half of a time. All right. So what does that equal? One plus two plus three and a, uh, one plus two plus a half is three and a half. All right. So the angel is saying, how long are the people of God going to be scattered? Remember the verse. How long are people going to go and endure that time where they've been persecuted? 
three and a half times. Well, in Bible prophecy, one time equals one year, one prophetic year. Okay. And in one prophetic year, you also see that as days oftentimes too. These all mean the same thing. All right. So now with that understanding, when he says a time, times and a half a time, we have a year in the Hebrew day or Hebrew calendar, excuse me, in the Hebrew calendar, Hebrew calendar had 360 days. In the Hebrew calendar. So now the idea of a time, times and a half, three and a half years, if we were to take this math now, three and a half and multiply that again times three and a half years, and each year has 360 days, you're going to come to 360 times three and a half. Let me even get, let me verify this thing so y'all can see, are oh, they trying to do some, do some, make some prophecies fit, fit their feet, fit their shoe. 360 times 3.5. Da, 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 da. That's the theme to your story hour. Here's the story, folks. That's 1260. 1260. Let's get back to our chalkboard. 1260. Oh man, I cut off my copy. 1260 days prophetically. And we know, based on the day for a year principle, Numbers 14. Just like the children of Israel, they didn't walk in, 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 the, in the desert for 40 days, but prophetically speaking, it was 40 days equaling 40 years. So if one prophetic day per year, 1260 days actually equals now 1260 years. Calendar check, calendar check. How long were the people of God scattered? How long were the people of God pushed aside and persecuted? From 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. gives you a grand total of verified Bible mathematics of 1260 years. Don't tell me God is not in control. And this is important because the time of trouble, that is the time of trouble, is not a time of trouble for the church. I'm going to have to... I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going ha to have to stop. I'm going to have to pause right here and pick this ball up in, in the sermon because this is a lot. This is a lot. This is a long time. And, and we got to take a breath and we got to breathe. And I want to do that because when we come back to our, our study time, we're going to talk about these other two time prophecies and why that's important for us today in 2020. We're going to look at the 1290. We're going to look at the, the 1335. And we're going to talk about right now in 2020. Can we do that? I love it. We, we're just following the spirit. But we're going to stop here and take a break because I want you to take a break, get something to drink, breathe. And let's talk a little bit about health, because um, that's a part of what we do here when we come together and worship. So that's what we're going to do by the spirit. I feel impressed to pause. We're going to pause here and we're going to transition. We're going to transition to change health. And what we like to do in change health is talk about practical ways that we can experience the gospel through the health principles and the lifestyle choices that we make in the name of Jesus. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna take a pause here. Let's take a five minute break. I'm at 12.05 Eastern time right now. Let's take a five minute break and come back together. Please listen to me. When you take a break, please don't leave. Now, the only reason why you can leave is if you're going to somebody else's church, all right? If you're going to somebody else's service, God bless you. This is all gonna be recorded. Make sure you catch it later. We love you, we appreciate you. But if, if you drop out, to go do something else, man, that's, that's, you're gonna miss out on some really good stuff we're gonna share with you. So let's take our five minute break. Make sure you come back and we'll follow up and continue our study and our celebration today here at Change Fellowship. Hey, if you enjoyed today's lesson in prophecy, be sure to visit our website, changeministry.org slash the highway home. Here you're gonna find two visual studies that guide you through every prophetic event from now until the coming of Christ. And you'll even find a step-by-step -step study that goes deeper into the word of God so that you can find both the peace and the power that comes from the promise of Jesus' return.